Hello everyone. Um, I hope you are all fed and watered and you know generally comfortable. Uh, you know, at least in, in my time zone, it's a little after lunch. Because um, uh, the topic I'm talking about today isn't exactly fun. Um, in fact, it's kind of downright depressing. But it is important, and that's why I was inspired to share with you. Um, so first I'd like to start by defining some terminology. Uh, this is called exit strategies for persistent games. So, I mean, what do I mean by a persistent game? Uh, you know, let's just get on the same page here. Um, I'm talking about a game that relies on content to be released periodically after the initial ship date. So mostly, some examples would be things like, like trading card games um, or MMOs uh, or even you know your standard garden variety Facebook game. Um, and basically, I'm not talking about console or PC games where you just ship it, don't have any plans for ongoing DLC, and and just move on to the next project. It does actually apply to non-game companies, uh, anything that provides a regular ongoing service, like ISPs or utility companies. But since this is all DevConf, I'll limit the discussion mostly to games. Um, so the next question you might wonder is, okay, so that's what a persistent game is. What do I mean by an exit strategy? And what I mean is a, a contingency plan um, you know, with you, within your development team to cover three possible future events that all involve the game being shut down or transitioned in some way. Um, the, first, um, the first possible event you want to plan for is if a persistent game you're working on is being shut down. Uh, an example might be your company might choose to cancel a game for business reasons, such as not monetizing well enough to cover its costs, even if the company itself is still doing fine overall. Um, the second case to plan for is your co company is going out of business and the ownership of your games is being transferred to a new owner. Uh, some games actually outlive the companies that created them. And the third case is your company is going out of business and all your games are being shut down. Uh, those of you who have been in the game industry longer than a year or two have probably seen some studio closings. So you know that this happens. Um, you know, it's not just kind of out of left field. Um, now, before I go further, you may be wondering, okay, well, you know, why should I care about this? Um, and the reason, main reason is you have a reputation. Uh, you personally have a reputation, your games have reputations, and your studio or publishing house or wherever you're working for has a reputation. And this reputation follows you around for your entire career and your entire life. Um, so I want you to just kind of imagine this, because uh, I know what I Whatever ISP you use, you probably hate them and think they're evil and all, because um, they all suck. Um, but you're probably not switching. The other competitor in your area is probably just as evil as the one you're going with. Um, but suppose, just, just imagine that you wake up one day and your internet just at home just didn't work. Like, no warning, you check everything on your end, it seems fine. So you call up the ISP's 800 number to get some tech support. And you get just this automated message saying, oh, we're sorry, but service to your entire area has been terminated by our company for business reasons, so you'll have to find another provider. We apologize for the inconvenience. And that's it. Um, now, this would be a huge screw you for most of us. Um, and suppose you move, you know, and we, th this is not something we would enjoy, right? And so suppose now that after having this having happened to you, you move to a new city. And the choice of ISPs is between this one that just dumped you and some other sucky, evil ISP. Um, I bet most of you, after going through this once, would pick the other one that didn't do this to you. And furthermore, if you ever ran into an ISP that actually gave you some kind of guarantee of service, that, you know, for example, any intentional service shutdown would be given with at least a month of warning, and it happened. if that happened, then they would pay to switch you over to a competitor, or something like that. Where, you know, this is something that's highly unlikely. But if someone, an ISP, guaranteed that after this had happened to you, I bet you would sign up with them immediately, other things being equal. Because once you've been burned, you would gladly pay to not ever have, have that happen again. Um, so just a little guarantee over something that probably won't even affect you would get uh, an ISP a subscriber for years. A small payment now that's worth a boatload, or a small payment later that's worth a boatload of cash right now. Um, so think about the analogy here in the game space. So when you're shutting down an online game that someone's actively playing, you can see this parallel. I mean, someone that's shown that they will regularly spend $15 a month for your subscription-based game, or thousands a year on a free-to-play game, 
Uh, that's someone you really want to attract and someone you really don't want to just piss off um, if you're responsible for killing their hobby. So, you know, think of an exit strategy as something like a last will and testament. No one ever enjoys uh, writing out their will, right? It requires serious thinking about and accepting your own mortality. Uh, so it's kind of depressing. It's something that people want to put off. But at the same time, it's really a responsible thing to do because it simplifies life greatly for your heirs. And the one thing you really don't want is for you to die unexpectedly and have all the people in your life that you care about fighting over, you know, fighting with each other and fighting with the courts about what happens to the stuff that you had that you wanted to pass down to them. Um, and this goes double for games because you might be your own heir in the sense that how you handle the death of your game will follow you personally throughout your career. Your players are noticing. Um, you know, and make no, no mistake, the reason why a will is a good idea is that it is 100% guaranteed that you will die sooner or later. Um, and the same is true of whatever game you're working on right now and whatever company you are at right now. You know, might be tomorrow, might be in six months or five years or 10 or 20 years, but it can't last forever. I mean, you know, the East India Trading Company, not really around today, right? I mean, no company lasts forever. And, you know, eventually the technology beyond the game you're working on is going to be obsolete or something improved will come along that will pull enough customers away that it will no longer be worth it to keep running. Um, something will happen. This is 100% guaranteed. You can't always predict it. You cannot prevent it. But you can plan for it. Um, so also realize that if your game is shut down, during there's going to be a lot of tension in your studio. There's not going to be enough time. Things are crazy and chaotic when this happens. And any decisions that you make under duress are going to be of lower quality than decisions that you made ahead of time when there was no pressure. So let me just be clear, having an exit plan will not remove the chaos at the end, but it will at least give you ordered chaos. Um, now, a little while ago, I asked on Twitter for people to share their stories about how their company handled a shutdown uh, of a persistent game. And what I found was, at least, it is shockingly common for companies to not do anything. No advance planning, sometimes not even in, in any advance warning to players. Uh, players will just log in to the Facebook game they've been playing one day and find an announcement that the game is now down forever, you know, effective immediately. And I mean, really, I want you all to think about this. Is this really how you want to treat your customers? I mean, how many times do you think this is going to happen? happen in the Facebook space to these mythical whale people. That's what they're called for some reason. You know, the ones that spend disproportionately large amounts of money on a free-to-play game. Uh, before those people say, well, maybe I shouldn't spend money on these things anymore if it's just going to go away. Maybe these people will just never play your games again. Or maybe the industry for good. Uh, these certainly aren't going to go out of their way to give your company more money, though, uh, after you you know, take their take thousands of dollars of their money and then just flush it down the toilet. Uh, so think hard about exit strategies if you plan on staying the, in this industry for more than a few months. I mean, really, this kind of treatment of our customers is poisonous to the whole community. And hey, you know, if you are just here for a few months to make a quick buck, strip mine the player base, and then please get the hell out of my industry. Okay, thanks. Uh, glad to get that off my chest. Um, so, okay, suppose you're on board with this concept and you're thinking, okay, how do I bring this up to my team? Um, you know, how do we go about actually making an exit strategy so that we do things better? Like, if I just go, at, if I'm just a producer and I go to the team and say, hey, everyone, let's have a meeting to talk about the eventual demise of the game. No, I promise this has thing. This is not a harbinger of things to come. This is just um, to plan things out in advance. Promise. Um, it's usually not going to go over that well. So where do you start? Um, you know, the first thing I would say is find a comfortable set. Create a comfortable set. Bring in some lunch. You know, pizza is the traditional choice of food for most game developers I know. People will be in a better mood to talk about depressing stuff if they've been well fed and are generally otherwise content. Um, you know, step two: explain that this really is not. This is just a contingency plan. It's not a subtle hint that people are about to get their pink slips tomorrow. 
hopefully you've built up that kind of trust with your developers and they'll take your word for it. If you haven't, try harder not to be an untrustworthy lying scum in the future. But in the meantime, if you have the meeting this week, you can at least blame it on my talk. So remember that this is in everyone's best interest. How you handle a game shutdown reflects on all of you, and you don't want to screw this up. Step three, um, have a specific set of questions to your, specific to your game and your company that you're going to need answered before the meeting starts. Just do your preparation ahead of time. If you know your goals, it'll be easier to get through them instead of everyone just sitting around being depressed. So you might wonder, okay, you know, what questions do we need to answer? I'll give some examples, but there's, I'll, I'll let you know now, there's no universal set of questions here. Just like there's you know, no universal design doc template, right? I mean, everything is specific to your company and your team and your games. But there is one overriding principle, uh, kind of a core vision for th everything that should guide you in how to do this. And that is, if you can do it now, do it now. You want to have it so that when you reach the hardest time of a project cycle, which is having to shut down this game, leave yourself with the minimum amount of work to do, and especially leave yourself with as few decisions that you need to make under pressure, so that when that time comes, people can basically fall back on a predetermined plan and doing a bunch of mechanical, mindless work. Um, so let's get into some specifics. What decisions can you make ahead of time? Um, for each product line, one question that you might want to ask is this. Even if you have, have to stop producing new content and just leave the game in its final state, under what conditions would players still be able to continue playing the game? Um, if there are technical issues that prevent ongoing play, how much development effort would it take to make it possible? Um, you know, after development stops, and, you know, and if it is possible for your players to keep playing the game after you shut it down, um, and, and stop all development work. How long can customer support and other ancillary functions continue? Uh, now the considerations here are different depending on the type of game and the na nature of the shutdown. I mean, if you're talking about a game that gets a huge amount of traffic so that the bandwidth costs are not trivial, it might just not be financially feasible to keep a server running. But then you might ask, well, okay, would it be feasible to release a server executable so that players could set up their own local servers? Uh, could you change the client so that players could at least play single-player local or peer-to-peer -peer over internet with their friends? Um, for a Facebook or a Flash game, could you throw it on a portal like Congregate or Newgrounds and let them deal with the bandwidth? Um, in the, if it's a case of something like a Facebook game that's actually killed by Facebook its itself, and you know this has happened before, where Facebook banned a game that violated its terms of service, or you know an iOS free-to-play game that's pulled from the Apple Store because you violate Apple's terms of service, something like that. Um, what would it take to migrate the game to another platform in order to keep it alive? Um, I mean, in the event of any kind of shutdown, uh, another, another thing that you'll want to think of is what kinds of questions are your players likely to have? What kinds of concerns do you anticipate them having? And how can you best address them? Um, so think about things like, you know, players would ask things like, uh, what will happen to my character? Or do you have any other games that I can start playing now that this one's going away? Um, is there any incentive for them to switch over and follow you to a different game? Um, you know, and also just think of answers to more general questions like, why is this happening? Why are you shutting down this game? Why can't you just keep it going? Um, and how do you answer that in a way that's firm but still diplomatic? Um, Another uh, thing to think about is, is there anyone outside of your company that deserves to get some advance notice of the com coming shutdown before either the press or the player community? Someone who can be trusted not to leak this information, but who still needs to have it. Um, and you might wonder, well, you know, what would, what would be an example of that? Um, so one example, um, one of the games I worked on was this online trading card game, uh, and our company had just you know, our company's business model was just to sell random booster packs and not singles, uh, for the same reason that Wizards of the Coast doesn't sell singles for Magic the Gathering direct to the public. Um, but this created a customer support problem, because what would happen is players want singles, they want to purchase them from someone, uh, and so they'll purchase them from each other. Uh, so they start dealing in singles with each other, cards for cash. And sooner or later, someone's going to get scammed, because our system 
uh, our game didn't have a mechanism for trading cards for cash. We weren't a bank. We couldn't handle cash transactions. Um, all we could do is cards for cards. So, you know, so, so the cash transaction was happening outside of our servers. It was something we didn't have any control over, and so someone somewhere is going to get scammed. Someone's going to promise cards or promise cash and take the other one, other person's things and not cough up. Um, and then they're going to come to us uh, to see what we can do to reverse their trade. Um, so, you know, as you can imagine, this was a, a pretty uh, big support burden uh, and also a huge annoyance to our customers. Uh, so our solution was to have this validation process where we had these authorized resellers. Um, these were basically players in our community that had gone through some kind of background check. And we basically told the player community, hey, buy from an authorized broker, and we as a company will guarantee your transaction if they scam you. Uh, anyone else, all bets are off. Um, it was a good deal for resellers because they're able to buy cards from us at a discount uh, and run a modestly profitable side business to fuel their gaming habit. Uh, and they kind of get free press from us, you know, free advertising from us. Um, it was a good deal for us because the resellers brought a lot of cards. So it was like a guaranteed income stream to us. It let us um, you know, kind of budget things a little bit more uh, easily than we would have otherwise. And uh, it also let us directly reach a market that we couldn't tap ourselves, um, and, you know, the, which is the singles market. Um, and it let us uh, cut down on a lot of our customer support costs. And obviously it was good for players because now they had a way to buy singles. Um, so I just want you to imagine that your game had something like that. And, and then ask, if you were going to shut down this game, what would you tell your retail resellers ahead of time? Um, you know, or would you tell them ahead of time that you were going to shut down the game? And how much lead time would you give them to stop placing orders with you and start dumping their inventory? I, what are the risks involved? I mean, where one of these people could leak info to your player community. That would obviously be drastically bad. Um, so you have to think about, well, how much can we trust these people? Like, how much can we really trust them? And what kind of leverage do we have to slap them down if any of them misbehave? Um, and then you also have to think about the flip side. What are the risks of not telling them? I mean, you'd be seriously dicking someone over if they buy $1,000 in virtual goods from you on Monday and then they find out Tuesday through a press release that you're shutting down the game. Uh, so this is a really tough decision about what to do. And needless to say, that decision does not get any easier if you have to make it within the next two hours. Um, another question you might be wondering is, who owns the IP rights to the different parts of the game um, in likely scenarios that would lead to a shutdown? And how would other people be able to negotiate those rights? And there are a lot of examples of scenarios here where this would matter. Um, for example, what if one person on the development team is willing to continue running the game on their own dime, on a server, on the cloud somewhere, or even just out of their basement? So they'd want the rights to the use of the software code base, you know, ideally exclusive license, but that's probably not going to happen. Um, something so that they could just keep the game online, maybe continue making updates to it, and maybe make enough money uh, on the side to justify the game's existence. You know, would this be possible? What would it take to, and, and if it's not possible now, what would it take to make that happen, assuming that it's something that, where you want this option to be on the table? Um, very often if you ask your development team, you find that, yeah, they actually do like this game and would like to keep it around. Um, but that's not the only IP. But the IP rights to the code base aren't even the only thing that you have to think about. What about the IP rights to the game world, the story, the characters? Um, what if one of the employees wants to make a completely different game set in the same narrative universe? Uh, what if, you know, especially assuming that this is an original IP, um, what if they want to create a freeware tabletop RPG based on the game, just for the heck of it? You know, what if they want to turn your game into a screenplay featuring Sean Connery as a 16% ready cow? Uh, um, you know, so, so think about the IP rights to, to the game's content um, or, or the, the game's story and characters. What about the IP rights to the content, like the art and the audio? Um, if someone wants to use those in another unrelated game, uh, or if the artist who made those assets would like to at least feature some of them in their portfolios when they're looking for work elsewhere. Um, you know, if that's not included in their employment contract, is that something that they can do? Um, another thing you can 
you know, so there's lots of considerations with IP rights. Um, another thing to think about, just in terms of handling your player community in the shutdown, is you know, let's assume that you can give your players some warning. Is there some kind of in-game or out-of-game event that you could organize as a way of giving the game a kind of a, a proper send-off into the afterlife? Uh, so, like for example, maybe you can build some kind of world-ending apocalypse into the storyline of your game. Something where the world ends in some spectacular way. Or if your game is a bit lighter than that, maybe you can have like an in-game party where everyone can be online for one final day or a few hours or something in just a huge community get-together. Um, maybe you can give players a special offer to join one of your other games if those are still allowed. Um, the question that you want to ask is what would you be willing to give to your players, partly as a marketing strategy and partly just as a gesture of goodwill to the players who are you, have your, been your most loyal customers and who have stood by you till the very end. Another question that you want to be thinking about is you know, what specific tasks need to be performed for a graceful, graceful ideal shutdown and who on the development team is capable of doing each task. So these are the kinds of questions, uh, all these things I've been talking about, that you'd want to be answering in, you know, in a meeting to decide you know, kind of what your exit strategy is. Um, and then after asking answering any of these questions that are relevant to you and any other questions I can think about that I didn't mention. You can make a list of action items based on your, uh, based on your answers. And your goal should be to leave as little as possible to do in the event of a worst case scenario. So think about all the things that actually need to be done on your to-do list for a shutdown. And then of those, figure out which things can be done ahead of time. So here are some examples. Uh, Provide a way for your players to keep playing your game, even after there's no support. Have a plan to keep your game server running. Have a plan for dealing with community management and support after a shutdown. Have a list of any software enhancements or bug fixes that must be done by engineering before the shutdown happens in order to enable people to play. Um, I mean, for one thing, software fixes like this that, that put this capability in the game are much easier to make, test, and debug right now when the game is already up and running and stable and not being killed because there's no hard deadline. You can just kind of do this as time permits. Um, and if you can justify any software updates that enable this capability now, the business case for it is pretty simple. I mean, first off, it saves you time later that you know you're going to have to spend. But second, it actually becomes a potential point of marketing to your players. Uh, you're providing extra certainty for your players and that can drive sales. You, know, you, you can tell your players, look, you, know, you can sink your money into some other game and hey, they could turn off the service tomorrow and you couldn't do a damn thing about it. Look at their end user license agreement. You know, you, you'll see they, you know, all these virtual goods that you think you own, you actually don't own. But here at our company, we care about you as a player and we guarantee you'll be able to play our game even if a meteor hits our corporate office. So you know that the time and money you invest in our game won't vanish without warning. And the more times something like uh, an unexpected shutdown actually happens, the stronger this will be uh, as, a, as a point of attraction to players. Another thing you can do right now is draft official facts and unofficial community announcements to post um, because that's something that you can right now and if you do it now it won't look or feel rushed and that prevents you from so doing something really, really stupid or insensitive at, at the worst possible time. And then if you do the, that, you want to store them in a place where they can be easily found, but never, ever accidentally released prematurely. Go back and review the documents periodically to make sure they still make sense, but you definitely don't want them to go out to the community when you're actually not shutting down the game. Another thing you can do now is, is find out what the deal is with the game's IP. If you have developers in developers in your company who have a serious desire to own and maintain part of the game, even if the company no longer exists, find out what you can do for them now. Now, I'm not a lawyer. I don't want to be a lawyer. But my point here is you probably already have a lawyer if you're working at a game company, and you should get them involved as early as possible so that at least you know what your rights and your options are. And I'm serious about this. This is actually a huge deal. And the reason why it's a huge deal is that, in my experience at least, the half-life of an unsupported online community is about six weeks. And 
others that I've talked to have confirmed this now. I, I admit my sample size is still small enough that I can't call this like an absolute universal truth, but I think it's a reasonable starting point if you don't have any data of your own. Um, to put this in perspective, that means that if you're able to successfully transition the ownership of your game when your company is shutting down so that some of your developers can take it and run with it, and they spend, you know, just caught, and it just gets caught up in legal hassles and contract negotiations for just three months. Three months, not very long. That game is going to be inherited with just a quarter of the player base and revenue that stream that it started out as. And that's not just people who left and are going to come back. That's 75% of your people are gone permanently. So delays are absolutely deadly to persistent games. So if there's any chance that a transition like this might happen, you want it to happen fast, which means get those contracts worked out ahead of time so you can execute on them in a few days, not a few weeks, not a few months. And lastly, create a schedule or checklist of things that must be done in the event of a shutdown, and another for things that should be done, if you possibly can. Have time estimates, primary owners, and backup owners for each item. You want everyone in your team to know what their roles are and what the tasks are in order to reduce the confusion and chaos and eliminate duplicated effort and eliminate things falling through the cracks as much as possible during the shutdown. This is super important because when the shutdown happens, when it's announced that your game is going away, you're only going to get one chance to do things right. You, you don't get redos. Uh, but knowing this also has another side benefit. And that is that you will know exactly how much time your team needs in advance warning to prepare for a shutdown. And that's going to make some business decisions a lot easier when you need to know exactly how far in advance you need to make the call, whether to pull the plug or not. And I'd like to leave you with one closing thought. And this is, um, from the player's perspective, shutting down a game is killing their hobby. Right? That's not very fun. But from the development team's perspective, Shutting down a game is killing their child. Right? This is one of the most emotionally painful things a game developer can go through in their career. I think it's even harder to deal with on an emotional level than getting laid off. I mean, if you're laid off, it's just you, um, and you can find another job. But this shutting down a game is potentially thousands, maybe even millions of players like the game that you made no longer receive joy from all the work and blood and sweat that you put into it. It hurts. So in the event that someday you are the one that has to break the news to your development team that you're going to shut down a game they've been working on, even if they're all keeping their jobs, just show some basic human empathy. I mean, I know I, shouldn't, I should totally not have to tell you that, and I'm sure that you'd do it anyway. But I have actually heard stories of producers who went in and basically just told the development team, hey, guys, this game's being shut down. You know, the same attitude, kind of attitude and tone of voice that you use to tell people that, hey, the pizza delivery guy is here for whoever just ordered. So don't do that, okay? Understand that this is a really emotionally hard thing and treat your developers with respect and your players, of course. So with that said, um, since I have a little bit of extra time, I'd like to go into a few case studies of games that I personally have been involved in the shutdown. And I want to uh, just say right here that it wasn't my fault. I was just on the development team. Um, so, you know, don't, don't let this stop you from hiring me or something. Anyway, um, so here's one example of a, a game I worked on. This was kind of an ill-fated game from the beginning for a number of uh, reasons. Uh, you know, dur during uh, development, it was originally supposed to be this really cheap, low-budget game, and then Paramount said, oh wait, this is the first online Star Trek game we've ever had. This has to be you know, bitter, bigger and better. And so it got more funding after it had already been built on this base of, of sand, um, which you know, obviously those of you who are engineers you know, or have any experience in that, you know that that didn't, doesn't end well. Um, so after a while, this game had to be shut down. It, it was modestly successful at its time, but um, you know, at some point, the money coming in just did not justify the, the cost of, of developing it anymore. Um, and I, here, how we handled this shutdown was basically we didn't. Um, we just stopped new development on it. Um, you know, let the players continue to play for a while. Um, 
you know, once the development stopped, a lot of time, a lot of the players just kind of stopped coming around. Um, you know, eventually player numbers dwindled to the point where it made sense to kind of shut off the server permanently, and it didn't really affect that many people. Um, so I, I would say that this ended up being not a vast success, but also not a horrible failure. Um, I don't feel like anyone really got hurt in the process, but at the same time, we didn't really do anything to keep uh, customer loyalty. Um, so, th so that's one way. So, so this would be an example of a game that was shut down while the, um, for business reasons while the rest of the company still went on working on its other two product lines. Uh, one of the other two product lines was this one. This was a WWE or F, depending on what time it was, um, branded strategy card game, of all things. Um, it's actually a pretty neat game, but, uh, you know, and, and this one had a lot of players. And this one actually had some interesting, the, the reason why this was ultimately shut down was because the payment server was shut off for, uh, for an obnoxiously long period of time. So we actually couldn't get revenue coming in. And, and the reason for that ended up being that one of our smaller games that had practically nothing on it, um, no players on it, um, so it didn't have very much revenue, um, that one game had like, you know, maybe 50 or or $100 worth of fraud one month. Um, you know, just one random transaction that ended up being fraudulent. And it ended up being like, you know, 50% of, uh, of that company's entire revenue stream. And so even though we had multiple product lines. Each one had its own separate payment thing with the credit card company. So the credit card company red flagged this one game as, oh, 50% fraud, which kind of puts us in the internet porn category. Uh, and then that red flag spread to our entire company somehow. So it was a really stupid thing that happened. And you know, for those of you who work in companies that have multiple product lines and, and payment servers, just check the terms of use with your credit card company. Because uh, you know you can get caught in something like that, and then have to scramble for a bit to figure out how to you know get people's payment uh, in a really fast way. Um, anyway, so the, you know so as a result, this game ended up being killed, even though the player community was vibrant, it was otherwise profitable. Um, you know, it kind of had to happen. Um, it, this one also kind of had this uh, difficulty, like the Star Trek one, that it's a branded, you know, it, it's a licensed product. So we can't just open source it, even if we want to. Um, yeah. So what we, um, you know, you know, but you know, and obviously, uh, you know, development had to stop. Um, so what we did end up doing uh, ultimately was, um, you know, we did we actually did have the capability in our engine for peer-to-peer -peer play. Um, so while everyone normally had to connect to a server. It was like one bit to flip inside the source code and recompile the client in order to enable peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, or I think it might have even been just you know having this super super command line prompt uh, where we didn't even do that. Um, I forget. Anyway, it was a long time ago. Uh, at any rate, it's definitely uh, you know. So, so here we actually had to shut down this game, but before we did, we made one final software update. It fixed a few outstanding bugs that, that people had worried about. It did, um, you know, and, and it also enabled peer-to-peer -peer play. And then the player community could go ahead and do this, this thing on their own. And as far as I know, people are still playing the game to this day. Um, this was actually a huge win. Um, when we announced the shutdown of this game, it was, uh, it was surprising to our player community, but they were, um, you know, when we explained what we were doing, they were amazingly supportive of it. Um, they understood that, um, you know, that while we were killing their hobby, we were also killing our own baby, and it hurt us as much, you know, more than it hurt them. Uh, they knew that as developers, we were passionate about this game, uh, and we got a lot of respect from that. We had some people saying, you know, hey, you know, if you have any other games, or if any of you are going to work at other game companies, let me know so I can follow you. Um, you know, this was a huge loyalty win because we went out of our way to make sure that players could still do as much as we could let them. Um, this was the third game we were working on. This was kind of a, the small one off to the side that ended up launching the company, also a trading card game. Um, this one was interesting because it actually transitioned in ownership to one of the developers. 
Uh, and this was the case where, um, you know, one where our lead designer said, hey, I would like to continue running this, but the IP rights were had to be negotiated. Everything had to be done, you know, from square one after the shutdown had been announced. And, and it did take about three months uh, for those IP rights to get sorted out. And then the game did come back online, and there were, you know, emails to the player community saying, you know, please bear with us. You know, we are still working on this. It is, uh, you know, in our intent to keep this game running. Um, and more development did get done on a volunteer basis from that. It was, you know, but at the same time, it lost a lot of players. So this was, you know, very, very tricky. Um, you know, and I wish that this had been done earlier in the process. I think it would have been a uh, much more successful transition if it had been done faster. Couldn't have been helped at the time, but you know, learn from my mistakes. Learn from our mistakes, right? Um, and and I believe this game is actually still online donorship. A second time, just a couple of years ago, um, and to new developers who are still you know working with it and trying to make new uh, a new game, transition it to a new platform and stuff like that. Um, so very small community. Uh, on, on the one hand, but on the, on the other hand, you know, the game actually still is around, which is kind of uh, remarkable. Um, and the fourth game, and I didn't actually work for the company that made this, um, but uh, you know, but I was actually an active uh, player in the community at the time when the shutdown was announced uh, in 2000. And this company actually, the company was called Digital Addiction. They made this one game; it was their flagship title, and then they ran out of money. Um, I don't know the inside story for that because I was just a player, but I did. Uh, yeah, but they, they actually chose a very interesting route to go in terms of how to handle their shutdown, which was uh, before the creditors um, and you know and bankruptcy lawyers and everything descended on the company and dismantled it for parts. They brought together a core group of players that were kind. Of, they they kind of saw as like community leaders. Uh, and really passionate players, and brought them together and said, "Hey guys, how fast can you incorporate?" And then once you have a corporation, we can get the IP rights of this game to you um, before the ceiling collapses in our offices, uh, essentially. And so you know you had this this group of like eight player volunteers who basically took over the the entire IP rights to the game and were responsible for uh, promoting the game and keeping it alive and doing further development work on it and all kinds of things like that. Um, so this was a very interesting experiment uh, to say, you know, if you know, can a volunteer effort by players keep a game alive? Um, and in this case, the answer was mostly no, uh, but kind of, sort of. Um, the game servers were kept online for an awful long time. But at the same time, development stalled, and it stalled for several reasons. Um, one is just when you're dealing with a volunteer effort. If any of you are, for example, IGDA members, you've probably seen this. You know, volunteer-run activities, you know, are not the same as those that are made for by people working on this full time as their paycheck. You know, it's you know, it's it's a different world. Um, and so when you've got a bunch of people who already have full-time jobs, and this is some part-time thing that no one's even getting paid for, um, you know, new development work is going to be slow. And so even, if, even though there was a, a, uh, a new expansion set that was already designed uh, around the time that, this, uh, that the company died, uh, you know, or like within a year or so, um, you know, it, it still hasn't been released. Um, you know, it was put into beta testing and you know just kind of sat there forever because um, you know there were never enough beta testers and you really didn't want to take it live without it having some kind of test. Um, you know, the other uh, downside of this and the other difficulty that this had was um, you know, that there were some very strong personalities in this. You you bring eight core players together who share the love of a game, but they've never worked together before. They don't know each other. Many of them have never even met in person. Uh, and many of them, as community leaders, have strong personalities, and you're going to have strong creative disagreements. So that is, um, you know, so we had, for example, a programmer, you know, kind of the only guy doing development work who really wanted 
to do things right, which meant refactoring code, it meant uh, making sure that no changes ever went live unless they had already been independently verified and tested multiple times, and, and so on. And you know, this is, um, you know, and, and so you know, best of intentions, but at the same time, not entirely practical when it comes to actually shipping code. Um, but when you've only got one one software guy, there there's no workaround. Um, you know, so and there there were similar. Uh, conflicts with other areas of this. You know, where do you get art from when you don't have an art guy, and when you don't really have an income stream to promise payment for art? A lot of that's going to come from the community, and it's going to be very variable in terms of quality. Um, so there are all kinds of problems that plague a you know a for-profit game that's transitioned into the non-profit space. Um, you know, and the history of this game was basically it. Um, you know, it, it stayed online for years and years without any new uh, development work, basically with the community dwindling and dwindling and dying a quiet death. Um, recently, it has actually been resurrected and put under new ownership. Actually, some of the people who originally worked on it are getting the IP rights back to it now um, and hoping to do additional development work and porting it to new platforms and stuff. Um, and, and the co community is basically going through kind of this revitalization period right now. Um, one of the remarkable things about social media like you know, Facebook and Twitter is that the online community of a game that's the, the game itself has gone, you know, doesn't really have an online uh, lobby that's large enough for people to actually you know, jump online and know that people are going to be there. But at the same time, you can you know, post to a Facebook group saying, hey, anyone for a game? And people are on Facebook. Um, so it's actually enabled small game communities like this to still stay together, which is kind of interesting. And I think bodes well for uh, other kinds of online games where players are interacting with each other. Say, you know, an MMO that has to be shut down. So that is; those are my stories. Um, and like I said, I, I actually put out a call on Twitter uh, a couple weeks ago asking other people for their stories. And unfortunately, the vast majority of stories that I saw were were very depressing. It was just, you know, yeah, I was working on this social game. And then one day someone came in and said, hey, we're shutting it down. And, and they flipped the switch off, and that was pretty much it. Um, and I said, really? You didn't, you know, no exit plan at all? No. Um, no warning to, to the players? No warning to the developers? No. Just happened. Um, yeah, that's pretty scary. So, you know, I originally gave this talk, uh, a, a older version of this talk in 2003, when some of these games that I would worked on were being shut down. And, you know, this was also around the time when the first wave of uh, you know of MMOs were getting uh, slaughtered right before World of Warcraft came along and kind of rescued that space. Um, you know, so it was relevant then. And then for you know maybe five years or so, this information wasn't even relevant at all to the industry because you know mostly MMOs were stable. You know, World of Warcraft was big enough that no one even bothered launching. Uh, anything unless it was like a real boutique game or unless they had a hundred million that they were looking to lose. Um, and then social games happened and free to play model and suddenly it's you know really relevant again. So I hope this has been um, useful to some of you. Um, and now I am prepared to take questions or have you share your stories. All right, excellent. Um, our first question is from Andrea Schubert. Uh, it seems like server merger plans for MMOs are a form of not quite shutdown plan. What other types of not quite shutdown plans are out there? Good, good question. Um, and I'll actually open that up to the community here. If any of you have uh, other plans for you know how to not quite shut down a game, um, you know, like I said, I've I've seen. You know, others where it's just you know one person running it out of their basement. Uh, the cloud certainly offers a lot of potential for this because you're only paying for the bandwidth you use, and generally, if you're using more bandwidth, it means that you've got more players and and more cost to cover it. So it kind of scales nicely. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll ask others if they please chime in if you've seen anything else in terms of what people have done. Andrea actually had some additional comments. I'm going to go ahead and hand over the microphone if you, if you do want to give any additional comments. Yeah. Um, hi, Ian. Hi, Andrea. So uh, 
uh, I worked with Ian on a couple of the games he mentioned, and um, Dirty with Authority was closed in early 2003, and uh, he made a comment, Ian did, about reputation and how uh, what you do and how you do it follows you forever. Um, I had a business meeting last week with someone who played with authority in 2001 and 2002, was there for the shutdown, uh, played it for a while on the peer-to-peer -peer version that we released, and played it for several years after that. And he brought that up in the meeting. I had no, you know, I, I only barely knew that he was with authority player at the time, and he, 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 he talked about that. He brought it up directly, and he, he said that, you know, that was a great thing that the team had done, and most teams don't do that, and it speaks highly of everyone involved. This just floored me. So I just wanted to use that as an example of, you know, what, what Ian's saying is absolutely true and happening in the real world today, or at least to me, it did. Thank you, Andrea. Ooh, Brian Green, totally yes. want to hear some uh, stories from you about Meridian 59. Yes, Meridian. Brian Green, here's the microphone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I don't, I don't read Twitter that often. Otherwise, I would have definitely been willing to share my experiences. I worked on Meridian 59 at 3DO um, from 1998 to 2000. Uh, and then a little bit after I left uh, 3DO, they shut down Meridian, the MMO Meridian 59. It's an older, uh, for those of you not familiar with it, it's an older MMO launched about a year before Ultima Online did, but it you know, kind of languished. It was a, it was a, it basically kind of had the pioneer disease where it, uh, it explored new territory first uh, in subscription-based MMOs and got a lot of arrows in the back. Um, but I worked on it for about two years and I left, and um, 3DO shut it down. And they, they actually had a pretty generous policy. Um, the customer service guys were, uh, I was the last, you know, of the dedicated developers to leave 3DO, and the customer service guys were the ones that were uh, implementing the shutdown policy. What they did is they said anybody who was uh, banned for any reason besides, you know, like uh, um, serious harassment or anything illegal, they unbanned their accounts. They basically uh, activated all accounts of anybody who had ever paid, and they let people play. I think it was like two or three months at the end for free. Um, and then right at the end, a lot of, you know, basically they had a big event, uh, kind of what Ian was uh, describing, a big event, you know, just kind of getting online. The game was actually kind of a hardcore PvP game. But uh, it, it had a really strong community, so a lot of us got online. A lot of the former developers, I actually took the day off work, and I went and then basically spent the last, you know, 12 hours that the, the servers were open, just kind of talking to people and, and hanging out, sharing, sharing stories and whatnot. And then uh, after that, actually, I started my own company, and I acquired the rights to Meridian 59 and ran it for several years. I ran it from um, 2001 to 2009 with a small team. And then, uh, kind of what Ian mentioned, uh, uh, we lost our billing provider as well. And I uh, couldn't find it. It, was, it wasn't because of fraud, just the, the billing provider we were using was really small and they weren't uh, processing credit cards anymore. And it was, uh, since we were so small, it was really hard for us to find another um, credit card processor. So uh, instead of uh, paying uh, corporate upkeep costs, I shut down the company by transitioning the game to some of the original developers um, that worked, worked on it way back in uh, 1996. Um, so the game is still running today. You can go to meridian59.com. It should be run for free. But you know, it kind of has the same uh, uh, problems with what Ian said about um, the volunteers. You know, it's the developers are kind of doing it part time as a hobby. So you know, it, the updates are definitely slower. But the game was kind of it, it, since it's an older game, it doesn't consume a whole lot of resources. It's able to run uh, fairly well. You know, the community, you know, a lot more community policing now. Um, but the development is definitely slowed. But I, 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 what Ian is talking about is exactly right. You know, you really want to, uh, you know, treat you, treat your community well. Uh, you, you, the, your reputation is going to follow you. Uh, and uh, and I mean, people still come up to me today and say, "Hey, oh yeah, Marine Pinot, that's really great. I, I really, was really happy when I saw you guys were, you know, bringing it back." And uh, it's it, and uh, I'll, I'll also echo what Ian said about the, you know, the delays. It took us a long time. I think the Meridian 59 was shut down for about a year after when 3DO shut it down before we were able to relaunch it as Near Death Studios. And yeah, we lost a lot of people, obviously. You know, Meridian 59 was never a huge, huge game, but a lot of people weren't able to follow us in the transition. So, you know, the after that, you know, it you know, and, and to be honest, you know, it's one of those things where 3DO wasn't, uh, you know, they were getting essentially a very token amount of money for it. They were, they were letting it go cheaply because, um, you know, I, I think they, they understood that 
only developers would really be able to, to use it in any meaningful way. Um, so it wasn't a high priority for them, and, and you know we were still kind of new to business, so it took us a while to negotiate. But you know everything Ian said is you know I, I will echo 100%. He, you know, I think it's really great uh, seminar. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, if we don't have any uh, additional feedback or questions from the audience, uh, I suppose we'll call that a wrap. Unless anyone has anything additional to contribute. Yeah, please. And anyone out there, share your stories if you have them. Um, I'd even be curious, just as a show of hands, like how many of you are actually working on a persistent game right now, and then how many of you actually, well, I don't know, is there like a hand-raising thing on here? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We have one up already. Go ahead and uh, raise your hand if you're working on a persistent game. Got two of you, three. Looks like about three, oh, four. And I think we're topping out at four. <laughs> and the other question I'd have is, you know, do you have a plan in place right now for what happens if you're sh if you're shutting down? And for for those four of you, um, and in my experience, usually the answer is zero. And and I hope that changes. Oh, I see zero at the moment. But we did have another question roll in as well, real quick. Last question before we wrap up here. Um. How do you think that large online games could handle this type of shutdown, like WoW or EVE? Um, this is from Sean Kirsch. All right. Well, that's a great question. Um, usually, the good news is that the larger online games don't have to worry about it, because if they're large, it means they're profitable. Um, that said, you know, that's not a guarantee. Um, you know, there was recently a uh, game on, um, what was it? Was it Baking Life? Um, or one, one of those? That, that was just shut down and has like a million DAU or, or MAU or something. And it was like this huge Facebook game that was shut down anyway. Um, and I, I don't really have the inside story of why that happened. Um, certainly, if you have a large number of players right now and you have to shut down anyway, um, that just makes it all the more important to handle it right. Because uh, you do have, you know, because then not only is your, your reputation being watched, but it's being watched by a lot more people. Um, so that makes it even even that much more critical that that you really have some kind of plan in place as soon as possible. Um, so I would say like one, one question I had from, from a colleague before I uh, you know before today when I was talking about them with this um, is you know hey we've got a game that's in development right now. It's not even there. Um, you know I'm too busy worrying about getting this game to the point where we can release it. And then I'll worry about um, you know, anything like actual, uh, you know, li like, you know, how to shut it down. Let's, let's get it live first, right? Um, and, and I understand that, and I think that's probably true, that you have to, uh, you know, before you come up with an exit plan, come up with an entry plan where you actually launch the game. Uh, but certainly as soon as possible after you launch, if you have a game that's successful in any meaningful way, uh, you're going to want to to figure out what to do with that. You know, and if you have to shut it down with lots of people, um, you know, then again, there, there's that much more of a consideration when you're discussing your exit plan with your team in terms of how to handle that. Uh, so as far as best practices go, I don't have any specifically, um, other than to say, you know, maybe if you have a really large, really successful game, maybe you'll need two exit plans. One for if it is shut down unexpectedly while it is still going strong, and one for the longer term of um, you know, it dwindles out and eventually just, uh, you know, becomes unprofitable or whatever. 